Good morning. As you might notice, we're missing organ music today. Liz is taking a well-deserved rest and vacation for a couple of weeks. Uh, and this morning, uh, Jerry is going to uh, lead the singing a cappella. You are required to sing as loud as you can this morning, uh, in spite of the pandemic. Um, I'm going to, well, let's see here. Let's join me in the call to worship. Let's, let's stand up. We wait for the Lord. Our souls wait for the Lord. I find hope in God's word. Our souls wait for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. Whose power is enduring love. His redemption brings healing and grace. We wait for the Lord and find our hope in God's presence. As you remain standing, let us turn to number 374. Standing on the promises, we will sing the first and the last verse. And we do need to, the hymnal, John Wesley said, you are to sing lustily, yep. okay? So if there was ever a morning when you needed to sing lustily, this Sunday is it. All right. On the count of three. One, two, three. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. You may be seated. join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, in peace or in pain, we call to you and you answer. Hear our voices, O God, and the cries of our hearts. Come and bring us your presence. Come and bring us your peace. Amen. Well, this is the worship service for Fletcher Chapel United Methodist Church for June the 27th. We're glad for you to be with us. Those of you who are joining us by computer on the screen, welcome to us too. We hope this is a meaningful service for you. Uh, I've got some announcements to make here. One is, you are aware, next week is Independence Day, and truly for Fletcher's Chapel, it will be Independence Day. Um, we sent a map, they called it, to the district office for review. Let me share with you what's on that. This has to do with what we will be starting next week. Background is Fletcher's Chapel has been conducting in-person worship since last Easter Sunday, April 4th, 2021. We have been in compliance with our plan for in-person worshiping in the sanctuary submitted in late March of this year. We have updated our protocols in keeping with the directions from the conference, including replacing our hymnals in a few racks and permitting limited congregational singing. Since that time, we have had no reported cases of COVID-19 infection in our congregation. It is our intent to expand our in-person activities and ministries 
to return to a more normal congregational experience while endeavoring to maintain a safe environment for all congregants. Now with authority for establishing practices and routines for the church ministry relegated back to the local church, we plan to resume activities which we discontinued because of the pandemic. The conference is relegated back to the local church, the authority for establishing practices and routines uh, for worship services for the whole ministry of the church. Uh, so we're taking advantage of that, if you will. For worship, we plan to continue our in-person worship service at 9 o'clock a.m. every Sunday morning. We will remove the tapes marking off designated seating, but we will place a sign at the entrance encouraging all those who have not been vaccinated to wear masks and to maintain proper social distance. We will maintain entrance and exit signs and will encourage congregants to enter and exit the sanctuary safely, being mindful of the well-being of others. Masks and hand sanitizers will be available for those who wish to use them. We have been limiting congregational singing in two verses of three hymns, but we will resume unrestricted singing as we transition to these new practices. For those who are still reticent about attending in-person worship, we will continue to record our service and make it available on our Facebook page and our website. Sacraments baptism will be conducted in person after conferring with the candidates or with parents about the vaccination status of everybody involved. If needed, masks will be worn by the pastor and by any who are present in proximity of the administration of the sacrament. At present, communion will be served in individual wafer and juice sets. These sets will be placed in trays uh, in the front of the sanctuary and congregants will be invited to come forward and receive a set return to their seats, and everybody will commune at the same time. It has been experienced that these sets can be difficult to manipulate, especially by hands that are not optimally dexterous. Depending upon the successful introduction of this method, we may search for alternate methods of administering communion. Um, I, 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 I bought these things. Uh, they come in a little, like a little juice cup with a lid over it and a, and a wafer on there and then a, another covering over top of that. And what we will do is, is everybody can come forward and take theirs, take it back to their seat, and we'll direct the, the, the using the administration of communion that way. We'll see how this works. Uh, and if, it's, if we find it too difficult, we'll, we'll change to do something else. Facilities. Currently, the only facility of the church that is being used is the sanctuary. All meetings as well as worship, all meetings as well as worship are held in the sanctuary. With the lessening of restrictions, we will open our downstairs fellowship hall and classrooms to be used for committee and council meetings and educational classes as necessary. This will also open laboratory facilities on the lower floor. Education. Currently, our only educational activities are three two-minute automated telephone calls recorded and conveyed Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and Tuesday and Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock. The information for these calls have been chosen from the Book of Discipline, has included our Articles of Religion, our Confession of Faith, and currently our Social Principles. We plan to resume our Sunday school then that immediately follows worship on Sunday mornings. There are two classes for adults. One makes use of the uh, New International Version Bible Student from Standard Publishing and the second class selects its curriculum from contemporary literature available from Cokesbury or another publishing house. We also plan to resume our weekly in-person Bible study beginning with the study of Paul's Epistle to the Romans. In addition to the Bible text itself, our optional text will be the basic Bible commentary of Romans available from Cokesbury. Uh, education classes will be held in our Sunday school rooms or fellowship hall with social distancing depending upon the vaccination status of our students. Business and fellowship meetings. Uh, depending upon the vaccination status of participants, meetings will be held either in the sanctuary or in classrooms or our fellowship hall. Social distancing will be encouraged and masks will be required as necessary. This will be the practice for all administrative and ministry committees and for our UMW and UMM, United Methodist Women, United Methodist Men. At the outset of the COVID pandemic, the pastor suspended all regular house-to-house -house visitation. As these restrictions are being relaxed, the pastor will resume regular visitation 
calling first to arrange a convenient time and assure the health and safety of the congregant being visited. Now, I'll make you a deal. If I call you in advance to say if I can come visit, you don't scurry about and try to clean up the house and do all of that stuff that if it looks better than my office, I'm going to be offended. So just, just be aware. Uh, we don't need to do any of that stuff. And I've told people about my, my, my bifocals. When I started seminary, words that start with a vowel have a, uh, have a little mark over top. And if it's like an apostrophe, then that word starts with a vowel sound like all. And if it has a first apostrophe, it has an H sound like hall. So, what I found was if it was close enough to be big enough to read, it was so out of focus I couldn't read it, and if it was out here that it was in focus, it was so small I couldn't read it, so I had to get bifocals. And my bifocals don't see clutter, and they don't see dust, and they don't see anything in your house that they shouldn't see, so don't ever worry about that until the preacher comes to call. So, just, that's between you and me now. Compliance, it is our intent. To attend to the directives of the Center for Disease Control, the Governor's Office, and the Office of the Bishop, and to be in compliance with those directives as they are announced. So that was sent to the District Superintendent uh, in charge right now, and uh, it was it was acknowledged and affirmed. They didn't need to approve it. No, that's what that is. Um, so that's next week. That's what we're starting back to get regular now. Uh, Sunday school classes uh, can meet. Uh, you need to work things out as to who's teaching and, who, and what you're going to be doing and so on and so forth. But that, I'm going to let that into the hands of the, of the Sunday schools. Um, some other, another announcement that you might be aware of. In the past, uh, after annual conference, the conference magazine, The Advocate, has always published a listing of the churches and the pastors who are appointed there. Uh, I don't know if this church has done it before or not, but uh, some churches like to get a copy of that and so they can see where the pastors they've had in the past, where they're going, just keep up with what's going on in the conference. I made several copies of this and they're in the narthex. You are invited to pick one up and take it. If you take it with you, I would ask that you bring it back so that others might, might have an opportunity to read it as well. There's uh, about 11 pages here, and I made five copies, I guess, four copies anyway. Uh, just be aware of that. So that is available for you if you'd like to have it. Let me see, I think. There's also back there copies of the upper room, uh, either for yourself or if you'd like to take one to somebody, if, if you know somebody that uses the upper room and has not been able to come uh, regularly, please uh, feel free to pick up copies back there. There are also some older editions that, that if you would like, go ahead and pick those up. And I believe that's all the announcements that I have. That's a bunch of them. Let's take a look at the Psalter. I'm going to ask you to turn in your hymnal. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Skipping ahead. Thank you, Bob. Loving, gracious, almighty God, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. It's awesome to be able to be in your house. It's awesome to be able to worship you and to give you praise, for truly you are our God. We love you. And we know and we feel that you love us. You promised us that in your written word. And we know that we can trust in that. We have faith in that. Heavenly Father, we... Once again, we look at our news, we see distressing things that go on in this world. We, our, our thoughts and our prayers are with the people in Florida who have lost many. We come to understand, Lord, that that building was constructed poorly, that it was not taken care of properly, and that people have lost their lives. 
Lord, we ask that you would bless those people, bless their families as they deal with the grief, as they deal with the sorrow. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would undergird them with your strength. Lord, we look around and we see, we see evil in many ways. We see people that lie. We see people that cheat. Yes, and we see people that steal. We see all this reported to us on the news, Lord. And we, we see all the evil in our world and we would come to you. We would ask you to, to bring justice, to, to help people to realize the evil that's there, if, if we don't do anything about it, if we don't stand for it, if we don't speak against it, Lord, it just continues and gets worse and worse. Help us, Lord. Help us to be mindful of that which we see and help us to have the courage and the strength and the will and the wisdom to speak up for what's right. Help us, O oh God to be the people on this earth that you want us to be so that, so that we can bring your love and your kingdom here on this earth in the way that you directed it. Lord, we lift this prayer to you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, let's turn in our hymnals to number 848. and read responsibly the 130th Psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, could mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you as you may worship. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. It's a good time for us to affirm our faith together. I would invite you to stand with me as we recite the Apostles' Creed. If you uh, would like, that's found in our hymnal on page 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you remain standing, let us turn to number 367, and we will sing both verses, I'll be touched me. On the count of three, one, two, three. Shackled by a heavy burden, Neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, 
Then David sang this funeral song for Saul and his son Jonathan. David ordered everyone in Judah to learn the song of the bow. In fact, it is written in the scroll from Jashar. Oh no, Israel, your prince lies dead on your heights. Look how the mighty warriors have fallen. Don't talk about it in Gath. Don't bring news of it to the Ashkelon streets, or else the Philistines' daughters will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will celebrate. You hills of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain on you, and no fields yielding grain offerings, because it was there that the mighty warrior's shield was defiled, the seal of Saul, never again anointed with oil. Jonathan's bow never wavered from the blood of the slain, nor the gore of the warriors. Never did Saul's sword return empty. Saul and Jonathan, so well loved, so dearly cherished, in their lives and in their deaths they were never separated. They were faster than eagles, stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep over Saul. He dressed you in crimson with jewelry. He decorated your clothes with gold jewelry. Look how the mighty warriors have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies dead on your heights. I grieve for you, my brother Jonathan. You were so dear to me. Your love was more amazing to me than the love of women. Now, look, the mighty warriors have fallen. Look how the weapons of war have been destroyed. And our epistle lesson from this morning comes from Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. Corinthians. I'll read to you from the 8th chapter, verses 7 to 15. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 to 15. Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you are at the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we inspire in you. I'm not giving an order, but by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for our sakes, so that you could become rich through his poverty. I'm giving you my opinion about this. It's to your advantage to do this, since you not only started to do it last year, but you wanted to do it too. Now finish the job as well, so that you finish it with as much enthusiasm as you started, given what you can afford. A gift is appreciated because of what a person can afford, not because of what that person can't afford. If it's apparent that it's done willingly, it isn't that we want others to have financial ease and you financial difficulties, but it's a matter of equality. At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit, so that in the future, their surplus can fill your deficit. In this way, there is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered more didn't have too much, and the one who gathered less didn't have too little. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his holy written word. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel according to Mark. And I'll be reading from the fifth chapter, the 21st through the 43rd verses, Mark 5, 21 through 43. Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him, My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. 
At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house, saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw all of them out. Then, taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talita kum, which means, young woman, get up. Suddenly, the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. Then he told them to go give her something to eat. Would you pray with me? Most gracious Lord, hide me behind the cross. May my words be your words. May our thoughts be your thoughts. Heavenly Father, may they be profitable for our instruction and our inspiration. In Christ we pray. Amen. I'm not sure how this fits in. I'll be honest with you. I've puzzled about it. Yesterday morning, I got up. Very, very seldom do I ever remember my dreams. But this was vivid. Uh, and I woke up with it. Um, I was in another church. It was very much like my home church. Little church back in Pennsylvania. Uh, and there was some kind of celebration going on. Some kind of, uh, don't know exactly what it was, but the whole church, the chancel, everything was, was uh, decorated and, and lots, of, oh, lots of visual images and lots of decorations, if you will, in the church. Uh, it was time to begin. I was supposed to be leading the service and I couldn't find my Bible or my hymnal. I left them somewhere. Didn't have my album or my robe. Uh, Things just weren't ready, just weren't prepared at all, just wasn't, nothing was going right. Entered into the sanctuary, and who was in there but Dr. Uh, Kenny. Dr. Kenny was the uh, dean, he still is the dean of the seminary that I went to at Virginia University. Only in my mind, in my dream, uh, he had been a retired bishop. Now I'm not sure where all this fits together. Um, but uh, uh, I recall that, uh, wouldn't you know, there'd be somebody in real authority there when I was going through all of this mess. It reminded me in my first Sunday that I was at not this church, but the last church that I served. And I had uh, put on my album, I had put on the, the cincture that goes around it. And uh, who was there that Sunday but the district superintendent? He came the first Sunday that I was there, just I suppose to check in and see how I was, what I was doing, how it worked. So anyway, I'm doing some things down in the sanctuary and uh, the cincture that I'm going on starts to slip and starts to fall and starts to get down around almost my ankles and I had to have congregation come. Some of the ladies that were there helped me get it back up and tied tight again. And I'm thinking, yes, all of this while our district superintendent is there. And here, here we are again. I'm, out here, and here's the here's the authority. Here, here's the uh, the higher ups in the church, and here I am, just in a bad situation. Uh, 
Anyway, I went out to find my Bible and I could come back and ask, ask the, the retired bishop if he would sort of keep things together until I got back. Anyway, I come back and I got into the chancel and I couldn't see the congregation very well because of all the decorations that had been put up. And it was just getting to be really crazy and really annoying, really in a way scary and woke up with these words. They didn't come to hear about you. They came to hear about Jesus. I thought, yeah, those words were in my head. I had repeated it at the same time that Dr. Kenny had repeated. They didn't come to hear about you. They came to hear about Jesus. And that brings us to our text today. Long about way to get there, but we've gotten there. And I'm telling you, I'm not sure how it fits. You pull the ends together and tie them up yourself with whatever they mean to you. The text this morning tells us about two people. Two people that had come to Jesus for help. Uh, Jairus. Jairus was a synagogue leader. He was a religious leader, if you will, in that time a political leader, since they didn't think about separation of church and state. Uh, that, that think, and if you go to Israel these days, you will find national things, you will find federal things, legal things that are tied up with the Jewish religion, with the Jewish faith. Um, but he was a religious leader, political leader, a social leader, had much influence over the people of his day. He had wealth, he had status. People desired to associate with him. That was a sign of their status, if you will, that they could be part of his life and, and do that and that. He was one of the people uh, that this story talks about. Um, then, the other one, my cards want to stick together, of course. <laughs> Fix that. The second person is the woman. Uh, Bible doesn't even give her a name. Don't know exactly who she was. Name other than she was poor. She was ill. She had been suffering for 12 years. Uh, with the hemorrhaging condition, bad situation. Um, she'd been to doctors, had given all of her money to doctors to try to make her well. She wasn't any better now than she was at the beginning. As a matter of fact, she's even worse. So she doesn't have any money. She's, she's ill. She's weak. Um, she's shunned. Because of the situation that she's in, she's considered unclean by the people, by the rabbis, by the religious leaders, and even, if you will, by, the, by Moses' law, by the law that God gave to the people through Moses. So she was shunned. Uh, no one desired to be near her. No one desired to have anything to do with her. But these two people, Jairus and this woman, have a couple of things in common. Faith. Faith. Faith beyond the commonplace. Faith beyond what would be expected. And if you will, faith beyond what would even really be socially acceptable. They, they did things, they, they went beyond what would be normal to express their faith in this Jesus Christ. The leader of the synagogue, man of authority, man of influence, religious leader, he came to Jesus. He humbled himself. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. There was something important on his mind. He had a need. He had a desperate need. His little daughter was sick and was dying. He knelt at Jesus' feet and he asked for healing for his dying daughter. He did it in public. He wasn't ashamed. Even though he was the leader of the synagogue and some of those people, some of those religious people in their day didn't want to have much to do with Jesus, many of his friends would not have expected what he did, but he did what he did because he was in desperate need and he had faith that Jesus Christ could heal his daughter. Now, the woman was poor, lonely, helpless, without hope. She'd been suffering for 12 years, like I said, not only ill and weak, but, but considered unclean, not just by the people there, but by the law by the law that God had given to Moses. But before we continue down this main line of this message, I want to stop for a moment, sort of go off onto a siding, just to examine the priorities of Jesus. Because here, you see, he had come to this gentleman, or this gentleman had come to him. Uh, 
wealthy, influential. He was somebody in the community. And he came to Jesus for help. And Jesus was ready to help him. He was ready to go and do for this man what he, what he wanted, what he needed. And it was during this time that this woman came to him, snuck up behind him, if you will, had such a faith that if she just touched his garment that she could be healed of the things that had been, been just creating havoc for her for the last 12 years. So she did that. Jesus felt that. Felt the power go out of him. Felt that healing process go forth from him. And was not satisfied until he knew who this was. Who touched me? So the disciples said, all this crowd around you, bumping in and not nudging in, jostling, jostling you, who do you suppose? But Jesus wanted to know. In spite of this fellow from the, from the synagogue, in spite of this fellow who had power and influence and wealth, instead of continuing with him, he wanted to know who this lady was. And he treated her and he said, he said, got her whole story. She told him about all that. He said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And then he went on to help this man of power and influence and wealth. So just imagine. So we see Jesus doesn't show favoritism just because one is of higher status. That's not what Jesus sees. He sees the inside. So back to the main point, the main thrust, the theme of this message, if you will. What were the two things that each of these two people had in common? First, each had a desperate need. They came to Jesus, they had a need, they had, and they made that need available to him. The woman with the health issue had her life in ruins. The synagogue leader had a daughter that was critically ill and dumb. So, first they had a need. Second, both had a faith that Jesus could meet her needs. And they expressed that need. That was another important part of it. They expressed that need. The woman, by approaching Jesus and touching his clothes, the synagogue leader, by publicly humbling himself, falling at Jesus' feet and asking for help. Following Jesus' directions, even when told his daughter was dead. When, when stuck in a place where faith is needed, what do we do? How do we act? What are we willing to do? When we find ourselves in such a place that we need help, what are we able to, what are we willing to, to do to express that need to Jesus Christ? Do we pray? Do we let other people know what our need is? Do we humble ourselves before God and let them know that we can't do this by ourselves? Lord, we need help. <laughs> I recall back when I was first getting started, one of my first churches. And we all talk about being busy. We all talk about how busy we can get. But at the time I was serving four churches, I was in seminary. Uh, I was taking what they call CPE, which is critical pastoral education, where you sort of learn how to be a chaplain, if you will, in a hospital or other setting. And, and I was doing all of these things, and it was on a Sunday morning, and I knew the week was coming, and I knew there was no way that I could get through everything I had to do that week. Lord, if it's going to get done, you've got to help. Saturday came. Saturday that fall it was in September. That fall came, all the work was done, everything had been put away, everything was done completely, and I was watching Penn State's football game. Now, God is there for you in many ways. When you have a need, you can trust God. God wants the very best for you that there is. So, is it the outcome that we almost expect? Many of us are aware that people have gotten ill. People have prayed for the ill, and those people have passed away. It's not always what we want. That's not always what God knows is the best. Consider for a moment, if you will, what Moses, who brought the Israelites to the Red Sea. He came, he came there, and let's see if I, oh, didn't. 
brought the people to the Red Sea and they were stuck there. Here comes the Egyptian army after them, full tilt. They're there and they've got nowhere to go. They've got no place to do. They've come out of the bondage of slavery that the Egyptians had them under. What were they going to do? Moses stood before them and said, God will fight for us. Did God fight for them? No. God opened up the Red Sea and let them cross in peace and dry land. We don't always get from God what we, what we think is the right thing for us. But do we have faith to trust God that God has done the right thing for everybody involved? Sometimes, sometimes he will. I'm seeking physical healing. Can we have faith that God knows best? And when the body won't sustain life, when suffering is too much, when the Lord, loved one, has suffered enough that God will release him or her and welcome them home into a new existence. That house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. You can see, it's about faith. And first of all, it's faith in believing in God, that God is good. Whatever we tend to think, whatever we tend to experience, whatever happens to us to know, and first of all, to believe that God is good. And God wants the very best for us that it is. And that God's infinite wisdom knows better than we know what it is we truly need. Next week, we're going to examine what faith is. And, and we're going to examine how you get it. And surprisingly, next week, I'm going to encourage you to be here because we're going to see what Jesus can't do. Be here next week. Amen. Let us rise, please. Turn to number 534. And we will sing um, all three verses. I'll be still my soul. On the count of three. One, two, three. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order. God faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, your God will Be still, my soul, when change.
and tears are past, all safe and blessed, said we shall meet at last. Receive now this benediction. We have waited for the Lord, and God has not failed us. We have reached for Christ, and He has met us where we are. Go in peace, to love, and to serve, healed and free. <laughs>